Welcome to the Kellogg Hubbard Library. It's lovely to have you with us here this evening. My name is Michelle Singer. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Hello to everyone watching the recording. Thank you to Orca Media for doing this recording for us. Uh, we are so happy to have partnered once again with the League of Women Voters for our eighth year for their speaker series. It's a wonderful collaboration. We appreciate their very good programming um, here at the library. Kate Rader is going to come up and introduce our panel. And once again, thanks for being here. <laughs> good evening. I'm Kate Rader with the League of Women Voters. Welcome to you in the room and to those watching from home. This is the last of our series this year, our eighth year of collaborating with the library with these subjects of civic interest. Keep watch, keep watch, we'll let you know what our next year's theme and topics are. Tonight the topic is mis- and disinformation in our election process and how we can identify and resist it. And here are tonight's presenters. Dave Graham was a reporter for more than 30 years with the Vermont Bureau of the Associated Press with later stints at Vermont Digger and as host of the Dave Graham Show on WDEV. He wrote the Fair Game column in seven days from January through May 2021. M.E. Kabe Mish, Emeritus Professor of Computer Information Systems at Norwich University, and is an operations management consultant. He offers security assessment, development and improvement, and practical advice for novices and families on protecting themselves and their children against harm on the internet. Sky Barsh is the Chief Executive Officer of Vermont Digger. Prior to joining the Digger in 2023, she worked in senior roles at The Nation, Vermont Life, and Civic News Company, one of the country's largest nonprofit newsrooms. She began her prepare career as a reporter for the Times Argus and Burlington Free Press. And now I'll turn it over to Sky, who will lead the rest of the proceedings. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for Thank turning you. out for such an important topic and an important year. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation. And um, we're going to talk through a few um, different concepts and how those relate to today. Um, and we're going to open it up for questions eventually. Um, but if there's anything pressing that you want to jump in, feel free to raise your hand. And um, it'd, be, it'd be great to have um, uh, some engagement on our conversation. So we want to start out with a question um, to see who remembers when Sarah Palin said, I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> OK, our first mis or different disinformation. So it turns out she did not actually say that, and we all think that she did, because Tina Fey had the caricature of her on Saturday Night Live. And I didn't know that. Dave shared that in our pre-call. And what did I do? I went to a website called Where Do People Go When You're Looking to Verify or Disverify Something? Snopes. Snopes. Exactly. Bad idea. <laughs> Bad idea. Snopes is known for all of its false reporting. Interesting. And, right? and, they're, yeah. and they're advised by CIA, so any foreign policy things are kind of skeptical. Huh? Yeah, I didn't know that. I so might not. Disinformation. Yeah, I might not only go to Snopes. I might also go to Politifact, which is run by run by the same organization that runs the St. Petersburg Times in Florida, a very well respected newspaper. Same. And and so if you get well, at St. Petersburg time, do you have any evidence that they're tied to the CIA in any way? Um, that group, no. Snopes, yes. So that's why you go to that. more than one sort, more right. than one checkpoint like that, right. and and you're gonna you're gonna probably want to get if you have three maybe is a routine thing that you do when you see something that looks like it might be disinformation. I mean, we can get to this a little bit later in the program, but this is how you defend yourself against disinformation is by by essentially being skeptical, checking it out, um, and remembering also that occasionally the impetus to check for disinformation is disinformation in and of itself. For instance, it's very much disputed, uh, just for one example, whether there was a whether there was collusion between the Russian state and the Trump campaign in the 2016 election, just for, for an example. 
very much disputed. The former president calls that, quote unquote, the Russian hoax. And so there, there he is basically saying that's, that was all disinformation that prompted the Mueller investigation, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so you, you, if there are individual parts of that, you probably have, would have to break into the pieces somewhat and check them out on multiple media sources. Are, are there media sources you trust? Are there, are, are there uh, I mean, there's a wide range of, of uh, sources of information out there. So go and, sh go and see what they've reported, the ones you think are better uh, than this, per this one where you're seeing it in this instance. Uh, and then go ahead and check some of the, some of the sort of fact check sites. The Washington Post is a very energetic fact check desk. Uh, as I mentioned, the St. Petersburg Times, the PolitiFact uh, program that they run, and then Snopes is one that a lot of people rely on. I guess you don't, but that's, uh, that, that's a, uh, I mean, you're never, you're probably never going to get a single fact-checking source that is it, that you're going to find is perfect. And, um, and well, let's let's talk about what what we're talking about. We'll back up when we're talking about misinformation and disinformation. And Mish, I think you had um, some good definitions for the terms because they're, they're they have some nuance and that they're different. These uh, terms even have. Uh, abbreviations in military parlance. We speak of misinfo and disinfo and also psyops, which refer to mistaken information. People who are spreading mistakes don't understand that what they are distributing is false. There are people who genuinely believe, I'm not making this up, that the earth is a disk and that the sun somehow travels around a disk floating in space. These are called flat earth uh, people. Um, that is likely to be misinformation. Well, it could explain how Sarah Palin could see Russia from her house, though, if the earth were in fact flat. Or, you know, I'm only kidding. There, the, People who are spreading this information, the misinformation, are simply mistaken. They, they really believe what they are saying. It gets worse, though. There are deliberate lies. We're familiar with disinformation from what we also call propaganda. These are deliberate statements meant to cause bias or disruption, often of political processes. Unfortunately, once disinformation has entered what we often call the information ecosphere, uh, the world of shared knowledge, once that happens, there are innocent, credulous people who will spread the disinformation. And so in some sense, you could argue that from their point of view, one would describe their actions as spreading misinformation. The originators deliberately lied. They knew what they were saying was false. They put it out for specific reasons, or possibly for fun. And I'll give you an example. But the difficulty is that these spheres can merge. And we end up with psychological operations, psyops, which deliberately manipulate a credulous audience, people who are willing to believe things without checking. And the psychological operations are designed intentionally to shift usually mass opinions, political, legislative, whatever you wish to describe it, that kind of, of operation can be highly disruptive, <coughs> indeed even destructive. Uh, when, we, when we no longer share a common base of knowledge rooted in reality, 
we can be subject to demagoguery, to shifting political norms, to the acceptance of extremism as legitimate political positions. So those are just some basics. One other quick note that you and I were discussing earlier. At some point, we will probably want to talk about control over information. And there's two concepts that are important for us. New, they're vocabulary terms, they're concepts. One is called intermediation. For example, our discussions mean that as we follow your instructions, man, you're in charge. We're not going to give jokes about, I don't know, naked grandmothers. It's not appropriate. We're, we have intermediation. We are controlling the content of our communications. The opposite is called disintermediation. And disintermediation means uncontrolled distribution of information, comments, opinions, and the like. There is a confusion in the United States due to the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which explicitly bars control by government agencies over the content of speech by citizens. Let me be absolutely clear. The First Amendment does not apply legally. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Does not ap uh, ap apply to individuals' control of communication, such as, for example, what people can post on your Facebook page as comments. You are in charge. It's your Facebook page. This is a really important point, which I think, um, if you all remember the, the uh, Hunter Biden laptop story that broke in the New York Post about a month before, three, three weeks to a month before the 2020 election, and then Twitter, Twitter decided it wasn't going to distribute this on that, on that social media site, and uh, I think Facebook did the same, and there have been a lot of complaints by conservatives since then that this is effectively censorship and the point I've tried to convince people of is, is that it might have been censorship if somehow the, the government had in, intervened and, and told Twitter and Facebook they were not allowed to, mm -hmm. to uh, carry this, this information. But they made, they made individual decisions, that corporate decisions, that they were going not to carry this. And to me, it's, you know, I, I've, I've sent a couple of op-ed, proposed op-ed columns to the New York Times in my, in my past, neither of which got published. And the New York Times had every right to say, thanks anyway, Dave. And that's what they did. And the government would have, under the First Amendment, has no role to step in and tell the New York Times, you've got to run this guy's column, any more than the government has a role to step in and tell Twitter You've got to allow this uh, New York Post story on your site. Should we take questions now, or well, do you want to wait until the? Specific, we ask, I'm just curious if you are well informed about the Twitter files. Well, let's get back to that. I would love to ask to try to keep this focused on the election year for now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you can share a little bit about what the motivations would be behind somebody sharing misinformation or disinformation. I understand misinformation isn't as motivated, but there's what's the there there? What's behind? You know, who who <clears throat> government is it? Government is it? Media is it? Who who is doing the misinformation and disinformation sharing? The biggest source in the election context, I would think, is is. Uh, political parties and individual ca candidates' campaigns who might want to put out information that's damaging to their opponents. And um, now, just in the last month or so, there's been this sort of scandal that's broken on the national political scene in which the, um, there, was, there have been allegations that the, that the Bidens were involved in uh, this company called Burisma over in Ukraine. There's tons of, tons of stories you can read about this online. 
uh, <clears throat> each of them allegedly took a $5 million bribe. And this all came from, uh, or, a lot, or mainly from this one whistleblower who was talking to the FBI. And the FBI turned around last month and charged this person, indicted this person on, on charges of lying to the FBI, which is a crime. And, uh, and so, and this person had been, according to the recent stories, in touch with Russian intelligence. And so there seems to be a, a history and a pattern here to some extent of, of Russian, the Russian state at least trying to meddle in our elections. And of course, there's a long history of the United States trying to meddle in the elections of other countries. So we're not necessarily claiming any moral superiority on that, on that score, but clearly they've had an interest in trying to influence our election outcomes. And so they, they have this story that the Bidens were taking bribes from these business, these, this energy company and its officials in, in, uh, in Ukraine. Now there are these, there's an indictment of this person named Alexander Smirnov, <laughs> great name, uh, <laughs> who allegedly was lying to the FBI about this stuff. So there's a case of, I mean, and I think if this, if this story, if the way it's unfolded now is, is correct, and take it for what, it, what, what you want to take it for, but if it's correct, and I think it's a great example of sort of disinformation morphing into what I call motivated misinformation. And how that happens is, so the Russian state comes out and says, we're going to put out the story about the Bidens being corrupt. And the Republicans in Congress, Jim Jordan and Matt Gates and all these other folks, are going to say, OK, the FBI has this one whistleblower. And by the way, the FBI is sort of cautioning us and saying, we're not sure how, the, how reliable this person is. And, and, uh, but, but this one whistleblower is making these allegations about the Bidens. And therefore, because they're damaging to our political opponents, boy, they must be true. And so they've been holding congressional hearings, trumpeting these charges and talking about quote unquote, the Biden crime family, and <laughs> et cetera. And this is the way our government, in the, in the Congress anyway, is conducting itself lately. You can think that's great or not so great. Um, the, the, and, and, can I and jump I, in with a question sure, for yeah, me? Yeah. So when we think about public relations and sharing and from official sources, there was just recently a, a heavily photoshopped image from Kate Middleton and her family. Is that misinformation or disinformation, or is that just a bad Photoshop job? <laughs> it's disinformation. It was a deliberate modification of an accurate photograph. Is it important? Well, if you look at the original photographs, it's not very different. It, in fact, puzzles many people why anyone would bother. Uh, however, it has led, it was involved in a burgeoning system of wild claims about Middle. She was dead. She was being divorced. These were this, that kind of misinformation, unless people knew it was wrong, in which case it was disinformation, was a result of credulity. People were willing to believe whatever is exciting. Let us briefly mention a little bit about human psychology. How interested is this audience going to be if I say A, B, C, D, E. Not at all. It's boring. It's so familiar and so devoid of anything unusual that it, it's nonsense. People are simply not going to pay attention. What we find consistently is that contradictions of expectations result in increased mental activity. People become interested. If I said, well, actually, this alphabet stuff comes from a planet orbiting a star 83 billion uh, light years away and was created before the Earth was formed. Isn't that interesting? Well, look, people may, may send me to a mental asylum, but they're going to have increased activity 
at least while this nonsense is being uttered. Misinformation and disinformation can attract increased attention. The second problem we face in psychology is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a well-established observation about human psychology. When people are informed of what they already believe, it increases their likelihood of accepting the information. On the contrary, when people confronted with violations of long-held beliefs, the tendency will be, not always, but the tendency will be to reject the information. We have some, I try to come up with a polite uh, adjective, some appalling examples that are being broadcast today of people of a particular political party who are being confronted with factual information that contradicts what these followers have been told to believe. And they flatly reject reality regardless of the strength of the evidence. So be careful. Psychological issues are being exploited by those who deliberately engage in what are called psyops, psychological operations, based in part on disinformation designed to strengthen the existing beliefs of those who are already biased, or to shift some of the people who haven't yet decided. I hope so that's Dave, helpful. Very helpful, very helpful. Um, Dave, you mentioned um, something about the national election, but I'm wondering if from your years with the Associated Press, if you could talk about any times you experienced mis or dif disinformation um, in Vermont. I remember there was one uh, incident when a, a candidate for the U.S. Senate, I think it was in the year 2000, uh, put out some stuff that was just contrary to his record on, uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and so I, I wrote a story about this, and he really, uh, and, and about this, I mean, ba basically what a reporter often ends up doing is saying, he, Here's what the politician is saying. Here's what the record shows, and and you try to keep up this sort of um, objectivity practice in which you invite the reader to reach their own conclusion, and uh, and that was what I did with this story. I can't remember much about the details now, but and, it, and it, I, I should have done a little better advance work so that I'd be able to relay more of them. But um, the uh, I remember the candidate who lost called me up after the election and was pretty bitter and basically said, I cost him the election. And uh, I said, actually, I think you cost yourself the election. And uh, you know, all I, all I did was report what, was, what you were saying and what the record showed. And there was, uh, it, and the two contradicted one another. And that's the way the, the cookie crumbled in that case. So. Uh, there was another incident where, I don't even know if this really rises to the level of disinformation as much as it was just a, an outright lie, but I got a tip that there was an incident uh, between here and St. Johnsbury on Route 2 wherein a governor was traveling from this area over to St. Johnsbury and uh, pulled up behind a allegedly too slow motorist in, in front of the governor. The governor's late to give some talk over in St. Johnsbury and his state police driver is trying to step on it. and. There's, I guess this was a section of the road where passing wasn't really a thing. So the, uh, they started honking and flashing their lights at this motorist in front of them trying to get the person to pull over. And the governor allegedly had a hat that said governor on it and was holding it up to the windshield <laughs> trying to show the, the motorist, I guess the person was supposed to read this hat in the re rearview mirror or something. Uh, anyway, I thought it was kind of funny and goofy and weird and, and I started chasing it as a possible story. Uh, one of the things I did was I called the, the governor's press secretary and I said, you know, I want to get the, you know, the official line on this or whatever. And he said, didn't happen. 
completely made up. Not, not true at all. Okay. So uh, a few years later, the governor had actually died. This press, press secretary, I ran into him just somewhere in downtown Montpelier. Uh, actually, okay, I think it was the Thrush Tavern. Um, <clears throat> and, and he volunteered that he had lied to me. Um, and I guess Um, and so, I mean, I guess that was a piece of disinformation directed at me, to, and it was successful in terms of keeping the story out of the papers. So, um, but that that was a case of uh, that's disinformation. Yeah, that that, that was disinformation. Yeah. Um, and I think there have been other case, other examples of people who haven't been completely truthful or kind of shaded things a bit, but. Frankly, I, I've always been amazed, and I used to say this when I was covering the legislature for years, that it's a very high degree of honesty in Vermont, I mean, compared to other states I've read about and been familiar with. I grew up in Massachusetts, and, and certainly compared, compared to the chicanery on Beacon Hill, our, our, uh, our state house is kind of pure as the driven snow, so uh, I don't know, consider yourself lucky or whatever. Mish, you mentioned confirmation bias. Can you talk about how social media plays a role in that? Very much so. Um, let's take the example of Facebook. There are algorithms, that is, computer-based rules, which monitor keywords, and this will maybe bring us into artificial intelligence in a little bit later. They monitor keywords in what is being posted by individuals. And they'll also scan photographs and, and keywords, any, anything that seems to be generated uh, or, or interesting to an individual user. The algorithms then either covertly increase the frequency of what has been viewed as popular, or sometimes they very openly put a notice up that says, would you like to see more uh, posts like this one? The latter is perfectly acceptable. They're asking a question. You get a choice. However, the modification algorithms that increase the frequency of what has been viewed as positive and decrease what has been viewed as negative by the individual user of that page, run the risk of increasingly distorted access to information. The problem becomes that with inadequate intermediation, incorrect information or extreme views, which are not particularly repressed, unless they are hateful or advocate uh, you know, punishment, death, persecution, and so on, that those existing biases will be reinforced by the content of an individual's access to other people's postings. So they will see more of what is consistent with existing views, feelings, and the like. Contrary, they, they will be exposed to less challenging posts, regardless of accuracy or whatever. That's part of the confirmation bias that is inherent in what we are seeing in uh, social media. One quick note, social media are increasingly using, a topic we'll probably discuss in a little while, they're, pro they're using artificial intelligence techniques to identify potentially illegal content. It is not permitted in the United States, and certainly not in Europe, to post pornographic photographs of children or photographs of abuse in Facebook or other social media. And that's 
in the United States, that's because there are explicit federal regulations which make it a federal felony to make, distribute, or store what is defined as child pornography. And the first uh, violation can have up to five years in federal prison and up to $250,000 in penalties. And a second and following violation of that law can result in doubling the maximum fine and doubling the, the maximum uh, period of incarceration. <clears throat> Let me quickly repeat. I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. For legal advice, consult an attorney specializing in the area. However, I did teach cyber law for almost 20 years, uh, very carefully making a distinction between emitting uh, legal opinions and reporting on uh, legal cases and law. So um, that's a legitimate description. You can understand that the algorithms sometimes make a mistake. I posted a legitimate Guardian weekly, Guardian from England, Guardian article about uh, photographs of slavery, which included a picture of slaves in chains standing naked in front of their prison. And the algorithm not only removed my post, it punished me with 10 days of not being able to post. That was a legitimate article. But the algorithms didn't read the article. They spotted, using artificial intelligence, uh, uh, photo recognition, they spotted naked bodies in the picture, and the algorithm immediately went into defensive mode. Is this terrible? Well, I'll tell you, ever since then, I have been meticulous in not posting a picture associated with an article. If the article has a, a interesting material and, and you know, legitimate description of anti-racism and, and so on, I'll check to make sure that it's not going to spark the algorithms into uh, what is called a false positive and cause interruptions. Um, I should explain that my Facebook page is full of political uh, resistance articles, a resistance to fascism, uh, anti-racism, I'm a life member of the NAACP and proud of it. Feminism, I'm a proud member of the National Organization for Women. Um, and and uh, it also has funny cartoons about cats and dogs and, and pictures. It has pictures of, and zoological information about insects and octopuses and lions and tigers and so on. So that's, hard, that's not going to cause any trouble. But, but you get the idea. The intermediation can make mistakes, and it can allow disinformation, or it can have false positives and block legitimate communication. I think it's one of the, when I think about confirmation bias and the algorithm showing us what we already like and not showing us what we don't like, it's a tragedy when you think about the, we have access to the, we have the access to the most amount of information we've ever had access to, and it's putting us in the most narrow box. And wouldn't it be great if it were the other way around? And, you know, we had... Newspapers have done the same. Well, that is, the, the, uh, Professor Bay just uh, mentioned to me the newspapers have done the same. I think there was supposed to be a sort of sort of voce, but it was true enough that... Uh, and, and by the way, speaking of disinformation in newspapers, I, I as, as somebody who had a career in journalism, I, I have to issue a bit of a confession here, which is that uh, newspapers have been known, and media companies have been known, to promulgate disinformation uh, in, with profit motive in mind. And I'm thinking here, in particular, of an era of what was called yellow journalism in the late 1890s, where there were newspapers in New York that were just co coming up with these more and more outlandish stories and trying to attract readers by reporting stuff that was very poorly checked out, let's put it that way. and. Uh, and it, it was sort of like they got into this kind of can you top this thing? And actually, a, a couple of them were would would have a box. The most outrageous story would, would be in a box on their front page that was done up in sort of a yellow tint, and hence the, the term yellow journalism. If you ever wondered 
where that uh, came from. Uh, I think the same phenomenon, frankly, was in play uh, much more recently. You may remember a lawsuit brought by a company called Dominion Voting Systems against the Fox News company. And what was happening in the, in the lawsuit, which resulted in a three quarters of a billion dollar settlement, so it was given a lot of credibility. Um, these charges were given a lot of credibility via that large settlement. Um, <clears throat> the allegation from Dominion was that, that Fox had actually lied about the 2020 election being stolen and uh, had, had, had invited guests on to make, make this charge and had uh, spent a couple of months after the 2020 election really kind of mucking up the public's view of what had happened in, in that election and uh, all, all of it in favor, of course, of the idea that, that Donald Trump had actually won and that had been cheated out of his victory and so on. Well, um, Dominion was dragged through the mud by Fox News because they allegedly messed with their own computer algorithms in they, they were running voting systems in different places around the country and supposedly they effectively cheated by having access to these computer systems according to the allegations that Fox was making. Lawsuit happens and, and the lawsuit in discovery, which is where you can get the opposing side's a lot of information from the opposing side they may not really want to share, uh, that, that, that produced a whole bunch of internal emails and texts between very well-known anchors and staff people in, within Fox News saying effectively that we know this is all uh, malarkey, as Joe Biden might call it, um, <clears throat> that this idea that the, that the election was stolen but our viewers really want to hear that, and we're going to lose viewers if we don't feed them these messages every night. And so we're going to keep talking about how the election was stolen, whether we think it was or not. That was the basic internal messaging being shared among Fox News staff during, during that period. And there was another case, if you ask me, of a, of a media company saying, we're going to put garbage out there just because we think it, you know, we have a financial interest in doing that. And so whether it's yellow journalism trying to boost your circulation or Fox News trying to keep their viewership high. I'll, it, just, I'll just quickly make a plug for nonprofit journalism because we're, we don't have shareholders that we have <laughs> profits for. So. VT Diggers nonprofit. So is the Associated Press, by the way. Just yeah. want to throw that in there. Just ahead, thought of one quick example that I've been personally involved in. For the last over a year and a half, I have been on a... I don't think I should call it a crusade. I've been on a mission to force Facebook to stop putting advertisements for counterfeit US stamps on its pages. And I collected in the last year, I collected over 550 images of advertisements for fake stamps. It's illegal not only to make counterfeit stamps, it's illegal to use them. So when you see an advertisement for a hundred forever stamps for $19.98, by definition they're fake because the United States Postal Service, A, does not allow discounts on US stamps. So I've reported these to the United States Postal Inspection Service. I sent letters to the lawyers at Facebook warning them that they are violating federal law and that I've already indicated their behavior to the USPIS. Whether it's just me or it's actually working, I don't know. I can't tell. But the frequency of those ads has dropped by an order of magnitude. Where I would see two a day, I might see one in two weeks. That's so, good. Maybe but that's maybe disinformation yeah, right. for profit because right. Facebook was being paid by the criminals, most of them in China, uh, it turns out, uh, who manufacture the counterfeit stamps. And by the way, the counterfeit stamps don't work. <laughs> the United States Postal Service has a, a straightforward systematic mechanism for identifying fake stamps. And it will not only uh, re reject delivery of the mail with the fake stamp, it can pursue legal proceedings against the victims who actually paid money for counterfeit stamps. That's disinformation for profit. So we know that there's a lot of, frankly, garbage on social media. And in an election year, 
two questions for both of you. How do you recognize it? When you see someone posting it, how do you approach it in a way that's gonna be productive, that doesn't come across as partisan? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we all take some action toward um, quelling and, and slowing down disinformation and misinformation? I have a very straightforward rule, and then I'll turn it over to our colleague. The more horrifying and exciting the information that you are being presented with, the more carefully you should investigate independently using sources that you have come to trust, looking for multiple analyses and comments on this horrific, ex you know, horrifying. The example that comes to mind, the Democrats were, were murdering babies and drinking their blood. As a Jew, it instantly provoked a memory of the blood libel which has been circulating for more than a thousand years. You see a story like that? Oh, by the way, they were doing this in the basement of a pizza, a pizza store in Philadelphia. There was no basement in that particular pizza store. And the, the entire story was disinformation. Hillary. Al's Hillary, right? Hillary Clinton. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Al's Hillary. Oh, the, you know, et cetera. So the worse it is, the more careful we should be. Hillary was slicing the pepperoni <laughs> uh, <clears throat> or something. I, wow. Well, she was allegedly involved in this <laughs> pizza company that, where the pizza place had a basement in which children were being murdered, murdered and, and et cetera. Eaten. Um, and, uh, and, I, and it, that's a pretty outrageous thing to allege anybody doing, and it seems as though it seems as though you'd really want to check it out before. Yeah. And 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 it's actually in 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 much. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, you have a question? Uh, I was just thinking back during the First World War, the British did almost the same thing, mm -hmm. front uh, showing pictures of German soldiers with babies on their bayonets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been going on quite a while. It's a pretty common. Yeah. Uh, um, kind of allegation that's designed to... As a propaganda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I bring it to very present? Mm -hmm. I'm going to name some sources. You can fact check me. The Grey Zone, Monda Weiss, the Electronic Intifada, and Haaretz all debunked the stories that we were hearing about October 7th, about the rapes, about... Um, babies being murdered. There, there was a whole series of stories. The New York Times ran a, a report that fits the description of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. I didn't come prepared to speak about this, but I want to bring it right to the present. Those stories that are trying to convince the American public that it's fine for what Israel is doing, decimating Gaza, they were all documented to be false, starting on October 8th, when people who were, the, I'm not saying it wasn't a horrible thing, I'm not saying it wasn't, you know, there were, October 7th was awful, and there was a whole series of exaggerated stories that were debunked by people who were at that concert, by Israeli generals who were talking about um, they have a particular protocol which tells them to shoot everybody even if they might get some of their own. And so some of the most horrific stories, including that one by the New York Times, there were three journalists, one who's very well known and then two who are lesser known. Um, <clears throat> track my sources. I, I'm not being as articulate as I would be if I had notes. I know The Intercept had a piece on this. Uh, the Intercept, uh, Jeremy uh, Scahill did the best particularly job. The, uh, particularly the, the story that the Times ran in December about 
rapes, rapes which were alleged to have occurred on October 7th. Um, and there was one in particular that was very heavily featured in that story, uh, which the family of the, uh, of the alleged victim, a rape, alleged rape victim, uh, later claimed that she in fact had not been raped. Um, I, you know, all I can really do is tell you what the various parties are saying about this and so on. Right. Um, but I do think that a lot of questions have been raised about some of that initial reporting. And, and that is a particularly uh, fraught time, obviously, when an attack like that has just happened. Emotions are running not just high, but off the charts, frankly. Um, and people are eager to demonize their enemies. And so it, the temptation is almost too great to resist in terms of exaggerating and perhaps even fabricating, et cetera. I and, appreciate that you have some of the details, and I just want to echo. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to echo and enhance what there was an, an initial had allegation said that, by giving actual specific sources, yeah, there including was a, you mentioning the Intercept, Jeremy Scahill, mm -hmm. um, the, a couple of people from the Gray Zone, from all the sources I've mentioned, yeah. were reporting early on immediately. And then maybe a month ago, Jeremy Scahill took all of the information which he had corroborated and uh, published the most comprehensive uh, analysis of that whole story right. as a summary <coughs> for The Intercept. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, this, this is a time when, when journalists are especially called, I think, to be hyper careful. Um, in, in, in that, if you're writing stories on October 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, weeks afterward, you need to be really, really solid with your facts. And unfortunately, the, the, the sort of backstory that came out about what happened at the Times was that they had a, they had a main sort of international writer who's been with the paper a long time and has covered a number of war zones. Uh, he apparently was spending a lot of his time in the office in the bureau there uh, and had a couple of essentially stringers who were out on the scene in southern Israel where these incidents were alleged to have occurred. It later emerged that one of the people, one of the reporters on the scene had actually been a member of um, the Israeli Defense Forces and had, uh, had uh, liked a tweet which um, said some very uh, pretty outrageous things about Gaza. I think she the tweet said something about let's turn Gaza into a slaughterhouse mm -hmm. and <clears throat> um, so clearly so showing a great deal of partisanship and so if you're the New York Times editor who's managing that story one thing you do not want to do is to be hiring any reporters who are that partisan um, you know you have to you have to be able to uh, very important to be able to demonstrate the um, demonstrate your objectivity all of those questions. Could, yeah. could I ask a question? Sure. What can we do about all this? I mean, we could go on and on about yeah. misinformation and misinformation. Very, I'm but glad isn't it important to know how to bring people together? I watched something last night on the Zoom uh, where someone was talking about how to get your point across, and they were saying patriotism. Put the flag up there. You know, in this country, we've we've become so. Well, you know, right and left, and and we all believe in patriotism, and putting the flag up there and talking about it can maybe bring some people together. I do have other ideas of things that can bring people together. I'd well, love to hear them. Well, I, I think that that we are in an interesting period of human evolution right now, where we've just in. In, a, in the blink of an eye, I mean, it's only really been 30 years or so since the internet became a thing. And, and all of a sudden, we have immense amounts of information at our fingertips that we didn't have when, when most of us were kids. Um, you, you know, you can Google just about anything and, and find out a lot of information about it, some of it more reliable than, than the rest of it. Um, and I think we are in a period when Basically, we're, we're in this shock of, of kind of breaking through to a new level of, of, of um, evolution and that we haven't really learned how to manage how 
manage these issues. Uh, what do you now? You have this glut of information. Some of it's garbage. Some of it's right on. How do you sort that out? And I think our challenge in the next in the next years coming will be to try to separate the wheat from the chafe. You know, and 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 it's not going to be necessarily easy. But I think we, we all understand now that, that that's a challenge we have to tackle. Mish, do you see AI, artificial intelligence, playing a role in determining what's true and what's not? Or do you think it's going to make it better or worse? Worse. <laughs> Let me explain why. There have, been, there have been some very simple experiments in simulating human speech or communications. Way back in the 1970s, there was a famous program called ELIZA. And this is back in the days, I remind you, I've, I've been a programmer since 1965. So I remember this. This was when we communicated with computers by typing on a keyboard. And there, there would be this greenish screen and the letters would flow up. ELIZA was a computer program of enormous simplicity. It, I'll tell you how it worked, but I'll tell you what it did. It pretended to be a sympathetic psychotherapist. So it would start the discussion usually with the same question, how do you feel today? And the person would type and say, well, I feel depressed. The algorithm was very simple. It had a list of adjectives. And if it saw depressed, it would say dollar string one. That's, the, that's the, the adjective it identified. And it would say, why do you feel dollar string one? Regardless of what you would say. Depressed, funny, good, you know, good mood, whatever it was. It would put that in the question, why do you feel dollar string one? And people would type away in the answer. And the algorithm would scan for adjectives and verbs. And it would put together a simple comment, always asking for more information. So why do you, or how is it, and so on. The irony is that the people who were being experimented on did not know they were talking to a computer program. They thought Eliza was a real person. Many of them developed very strong, positive feelings towards Eliza. Some would say, oh, I'd love to meet Eliza. She is so nice and so on. Now, that was in the 1970s with a dollar string one consisting of a list of words. We have gone way beyond that, folks. Artificial intelligence techniques of today use something extremely dangerous from, and, and you know, I'm a computer scientist. I've taught computer science for many, many years, 40 years. They are using correlations of words and sentence fragments and phrases. Correlations, associations. Oh, if this phrase, this phrase has been said, and it's followed in 2% of the cases by that phrase, and by 12% by this break, and they will construct grammatically acceptable, following rules of grammar, which were programmed in, they will generate synthetic paragraphs. Try chat GPT, you'll see what happens. Synthetic paragraphs, which sound grammatically correct, and they, they may even address the information. The problem is they do not have what computer scientists, what we call a world model. Eliza had no world model. It didn't, quote, know anything about reality of psychotherapy, about the reality of human feelings. All it did was construct sentences. There was, I'll get, I'll get to you, there was no world model. There isn't one in today's AI. Today's AIs have been found repeatedly to generate what are now being called hallucinations. That is, they look like wonderful, sensible, interesting paragraphs, and they include total nonsense in some cases. Those are the hallucinations. Why? Because there's no set of predictors to indicate that what's being said 
doesn't make sense in the world. It's they're generating paragraphs based on what they found in billions of texts, many of them used without uh, consideration of copyright, by the way, billions of texts that have been scanned for phrases. That includes science fiction and horror stories, but it doesn't know that it's a horror story. All it knows is that these words followed each other, these sentences followed. And so it'll say that uh, if you ask it for a paragraph explaining, say, why is it that uh, we believe disinformation, you might get a paragraph that includes a sentence somewhere that says, and the aliens, have <laughs> the extraterrestrials, have been feeding us with disinformation. What? So no. AI, AI may not save us. So be careful. Well, I, I want to go back to your, this person your, your question, yeah. ma'am. Um, and this person, moment, what, do we, what do we do with it? What do we do about it? I, I, I really want to get to this because I, I, it also morphs directly from what you were just saying. What do we do about this? And I really think that uh, um, I'll just interject a little, a little story. I once took a philosophy class in a, in a field called epistemology. It's the theory Science of, of knowledge. The theory of knowledge. And part of that, is, that field talks about how each of us has what's called a doxastic system, meaning the pre-existing information and thoughts and knowledge that we have in our minds when we go about the process of taking in new, new information. And the problem, I think, was just identified by Professor Pave with, with AI is that it doesn't really have a doxastic system. It doesn't have a pre-existing set of experiences and past reading and all the rest of it that it gives it, a, gives it a world, what was the phrase? A, a world model. A world model. So <clears throat> um, we, each of us has a world model. Yep. And, and it's, the, it's the source of our ability to think critically. And this is the most important thing we need to deploy as we, as we proceed through this glut of information, which is to say, we absolutely have to check everything we see against our first, our own common sense, Second, against our own research skills. And research is really very, very fluid these days when you have online search engines like Google and you can immediately check out a weird media report with eight other media outlets to see if anybody else is reporting it. That's sort of a very early step in the process. Uh, a, second, a second thing you want to do is, is just do some of your own research into Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, find, I, I find that to be reasonably reliable. Uh, when it's the, when it's a discussion of language, maybe it's the Oxford English Dictionary, um, but you you find sources that you like, uh, which will deploy facts. And so, uh, you know, when it's a question of I can see I can see um, I can see Russia from my house, uh, you first check out. Well, it turns out she didn't really say that, as, as you mentioned. Tina Face, Sarah Palin didn't say that. Tina Face said that. We, but then I did a little Googling today and I, and I determined that even if she had said it, it would be just complete disinformation because the farthest you can see from the top of, according to its elevation from the top of the Hubbard Park Tower is about 30 miles. Uh, it's, it's about 670 miles from Wasilla, Alaska, where Sarah Palin's house was, to the nearest Russian landmass. Mm -hmm. So there's no way, it's just physically impossible for, for um, Sarah Palin or anybody to see Russia from Wasilla, Alaska. And so you think like that. You, you, and, and you could sometimes go down these little rabbit holes, but it's so quick on Google to debunk stuff that you can quickly figure out that I, I'm not going to trust this thing that I just saw. And so, but that kind of a process is very important for any of us who's looking at, uh, looking at information that is, that is at all suspect. And it's actually, I think, a duty for each of us to do that kind of work before we share or repost anything. Mm -hmm. That is, that as a citizen, we all should take it on as a duty not to repost, not to share, unless we have taken, Checked. really checked the thing. And don't, and, 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 you, and I actually have a rule that, that says, if I agree with it, if it seems to support my point of view, I check harder. <laughs> you know, I, I, it, it's more important. Confirmation bias. Yeah, because you're trying to defeat your own confirmation bias. Can I offer This gentleman oh, has I'm been sorry. asking. Uh, I, 
I don't know if we're out of time. First of all, thank you for this important discussion. To me, it's one of the most vexing and challenging of our times. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard something around critical thinking, which is one of the remedies that you're talking about, yeah. particularly around young people and social media. It was a great NPR piece. I guess the lawyer, me, and not because I'm a lawyer only, goes back to common law and constitutional law as a framework for remedies, right? Like we were brought up to call a fraud a fraud, right? So should we have, I'm just going to pull out a few ideas, should we have a government fact check office? Should we have certain news outlets that don't meet the standard of journalistic integrity and ethics that are required for journalists be called entertainers? Should, should, should we have a methodology to um, enforce when there are knowing statements that cause harm, right? The old common law is duty breach causation harm. If you tell people to drink bleach to get rid of their COVID, you're directly impacting, apparently, many hundreds of lives. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, fact check, okay? I don't know how many people actually drank bleach, but the actual statement itself, and I don't need to attribute it to anyone, we all know in this case who it was, but it's, it, 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 it's, it's evil, right? And it's knowing evil. And I'm sorry, that's an abstract word that's not legal. But it, 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 I am Jewish too on my mother's side, you know? We went through this fascist authoritarianism where somehow we could allow opinions to supplant what humans know. No, knowledge is largely known. I do think you need to take out the profit motive in journalism. I think that's important probably in every area to get fairness. But, but uh, so I'm not trying to say I have all the answers. I'm just trying to say, why are we so timid to call a fraud a fraud? Why don't we use the tools of government to enforce more robustly, more quickly? What, I understand proof is hard. I've been in many large trials and discovery can take years, but at the end of the day, if it's clear that someone is known, I'm, I'm not going to misinformation for a moment, because this, the, but, but in disinformation, mm -hmm. that's fraud. And well, if it yeah. causes harm, it should be punished. Yes, and that's why, it's sorry, one thing, that's why the Dominion case is a very important case. Mm -hmm. Huge award in that case, yeah. right? That, and, and that was because they were banning them out, no one, it was like the Philip Morris smoking gun, yeah. right? Yeah. They found that people knew and yet the Liberty did something to harm people. Right. That's, that, that's crimes, those are crimes. I, 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 I agree that the civil, pro, civil law process can be very important, in, 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 and obviously with tobacco, with... Um, Opiates. With opiates, with with, um, yeah. with the yeah. Dominion, the, the, the Dominion lawsuit was a great use of the civil court system. I think mm -hmm. um, I am very, very reluctant, though, when I hear anything about when I hear anything about government stepping in and regulating or restricting what a company like used to be Twitter now X can do, uh, what a company like Facebook can do, uh, because the those companies, in my estimation, are just sort of new technology versions of the Washington Post and the New York Times. They are privately managed, privately owned, stockholder owned corporations which operate separately from the government. And Can I just jump in quickly? Yeah. I took a year under Archibald Cox and First Amendment Freedoms, right? Mm -hmm. We have restrictions around certain types of speech. Commercial street, com yeah. uh, uh, obscenity, incitement. Uh, incitement to riot. Yeah, sorry, you wanted to give me the fourth. But in any case, they're, they're, and they're very, very carefully balanced in the judicial system, which is a slow wheeling, because I'm not disagreeing with you at all. So maybe it's not the government's role per se, but we already have court cases and other kinds of mechanisms to limit speech and to hold people accountable for their speech. We do. And so in this discussion today, which I'm thrilled to have, and I want other people to jump in, we were talking about these elections. Well, these elections are using disinformation with very knowingly to sway, maybe it's Gestalt think and mass think, and that's a whole other thing you touched on, but I'm really like to get at the culprits directly. And what are we so timid about? Do we have to be an Adam Schiff to bring it up? I mean, who's willing to stand up and speak out and say, this person is lying, and we can show that they're lying, and people should hear that over and over. Uh, I, I guess I'm being too, uh, I'm not a deluded person, but I'm hopeful yet for humanity, right? Yeah. We just went through the Holocaust, really, my, my whole family, you know, that, that's not long ago, or young people, that's why I think we need to start with young people. Yeah. That's why this critical thinking in social media, did anyone else hear the, the NPR piece on that? Well, I heard that Germany and France recently passed laws about anti-Semitic. AI, they, they started, yeah, they did speech AI. that does, they don't, you know, those governments, the French and the Germans, Right. Passed laws recently. I, I think I, yesterday I, I, I think passed that, something on I, I don't know about it. Yeah. I, 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 my, my worry is that is that um, let's say that you're Galileo and you come up with this theory 
that <clears throat> no, actually the Earth revolves around the sun instead of vice versa, right? And the government comes in and says, that's disinformation. Remember, that's what the government yeah. did, and the church did back then, yeah. with Galileo who came up with this new theory, and he, he spent the rest of his life under house arrest, you know, effectively wearing an ankle bracelet. I of think those as times. a historian, that kind of <clears throat> smunches things together. <clears throat> Respect for you, Dave. I think that was a unique situation at a unique time. Where God, but I do want to give credence to what you're saying. If you let the powers that be just say, well, that's BS, I think there's a way. Human knowledge is pretty vast right now. There's a lot known in science. There's a lot known that we actually know as a humanity. I think that, I mean, you were talking about social media being that. I, would, I don't know about all of you, but I was a card catalog whiz. I mean, I could go and find out things about the whole world pretty quickly, right? If I had to do it alphabetically in the paper and all and write it down. But I, I just think that that, that I think the, I, anyway, I'm just at this point. Your point that we all have a duty ourselves also to yeah. question the information, I like that. I, but I, I just think there is a role for, for oversight here. There is a role. I think we have oversight through the legal process, which allows for the presentation of evidence. It allows for rational evaluation yeah. of correctness, of truth, of intention, even. Yes. And I would much rather that the courts of law, which are less, not entirely, less subject to political bias. I notice I said less subject, not impervious. But I'd rather see the ACLU and the National Organization for Women that I belong to, and no, the NAACP that I belong to, uh, all of these uh, agencies using the legal system to bring to bear the consequences of deliberate disinformation, of uh, that makes sense to me. Having a government-based, politically biased regulatory agency not keen. We well, see that we see that. that in totalitarian <clears throat> regimes yeah. all over the world. Yeah, and well, it's a disaster. That was my word. Executive branch oversight now. You can take the Consumer Fraud Bureau. You can take any number where, where, where there are executive branch or That's parts of executive branch that, that are specifically yes. charged with oversight alongside the judiciary that have their own review powers yep. and arguably the legislature when it finds out that things are not being uh, adhered to according to their intent. That's why there are three branches. So I would, I'm trying to agree with everything. This is important. But why only holster one solution? We should, we should pardon for that metaphor, as you get off of those kind of metaphors. <laughs> well, we, 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 uh, that was wrong. Why go down a singular solution track when there are multiple possible routes? I'd like to and offer some resources. Change. So we have a Federal Communications Commission, exactly. which has been disempowered politically until recently. Mm -hmm. It could be in their purview. We also have an extremely mm -hmm. corrupt system. I want to bring up a legal case that probably no one in this room, I hope someone in this room has heard about, but has anybody heard the legal case of Missouri versus Biden? Yes. Cool. I don't know much about it, though. I it was a group, and I'm going to bring up the Twitter files again. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to identify myself. I've been working on a critical media literacy project for about 20 odd years. Good. So I'm not just a random person in the crowd. So I want to be fair about that. <clears throat> and I wrote a whole bit of testimony for um, the Vermont, uh, one of the committees yesterday, which is talking about rhetoric, omissions, constructing narratives, and how to understand that just because the public has a general concept of what a narrative is, doesn't make it accurate, and throwing in about how uh, lobbyists work and public relations professionals. So I just wrote that yesterday. I don't want to talk about that. But I do want to be honest about where I'm coming from. Let me ask you, given your expertise, and maybe Theo also, um, should, should Twitter have been required to run the New York Post, to, to allow full Twitter treatment of the New York Post's 
Hunter Biden story in the weeks running up to the I can't answer that, but I'll tell you election. the Twitter files that were released when the person, Ted, Mr. Tesla, bought it, and he released all of Elon the Musk, yeah. okay. yep. undercurrent of, of emails mm -hmm. and distributed it to a small team of independent investigative journalists. Right, Matt Taibbi, et cetera, yeah. Yeah. So you're going you're gonna to have some more um, specific language than what I have, and so that's great because I'm kind of a generalist and I need notes for specific words. The bottom line about the Twitter files was that multiple U.S. government agencies told Twitter what they could and could not be publishing. They were the ones who said, don't run the, the Biden story. And there is an equivalent investigative report about Facebook. So there has I don't been think they said don't run the, the Biden story. I think what they said is this smells like Russian disinfo. This However they put it. And, and, so and my point is that we have Homeland Security, the FBI, the CIA, I don't know, maybe more agencies. Those are the three I remember. Well, government, government has been trying to. thumb on the scale of social media and doing massive censorship, and it's related to this story. I, I don't think that actually happened, and I think. Let's talk about Missouri versus Biden. Okay. So there were, um, I don't remember how many medical professionals <clears throat> who um, felt their medical information was being suppressed and censored. And they sued the Biden administration uh, through somebody more legally adept can say exactly how they did it. The state of Missouri supported them to sue the Biden administration because the Biden administration was this? censoring oh, the public health information. And they won this case, and it's up for appeal. So you're Googling, and I just want to say, Google is a very large corporation. You can do a search for the 10 best search engines and come up with nine more alternatives. Yes. The point, the truth is, is not, sorry, the truth. The truth is filtered through the lens of our expectations. Thank you. And there's a huge problem of lack of trust. Your truth, discovered by the law or by an independent journalist, may not be believed uh, and is likely to be repudiated. The belief systems are not fact so systems, right? It's, it's fine to talk yeah. about strategies and what we should do and be skeptical. But when the truth is presented, in this country, we have a phenomenon of, of mistrust. And, it, and we're not addressing that in Kent here, but it's a tremendous problem. I agree. Who said the truth is not the truth? Ministry of Truth. Ministry of Truth. Ministry of Truth. The truth will set you free. I, 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 I hope we never have the a Ministry of Truth. I just, I really, that, that doesn't bring well with me at all. So you remember when we were college, I, 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 I would be expelled if I plagiarized once. In my college, if I plagiarized once and it would find out, found out, I'd be expelled. Our standards have gone way down. We have primary sources for information in this world. Okay? Yeah. We're not supposed to be using secondary and tertiary sources to confirm our facts, right? That's why we go to individuals about their own life experience, if they're a witness. That's why we go to the chemistry of something to determine its makeup. Like, I, on and on and on. So I, I don't believe we're in a post-fact universe. I just think that people pretend we're in a post-fact universe, and they use it to foster distrust, I want to encourage you. I was a professor at Norwich University, the Military College of Vermont, for yeah, 20 yeah. years. Yeah. And I personally arranged the expulsion of multiple students for plagiarism. I checked every single essay for plagiarism. Today, we are having a significant problem, not so much with essays, which can still be plagiarism checked, we're having a problem with exams yeah. because students who are permitted to use their smartphones or their laptop computers in class are posting the question on the exam 
to chat GPT or some other one, and then copying and pasting rubbish into the answers. That's why I've been following this over the United States and the world. More and more institutions are forbidding the use of electronic equipment during exams, and oh my goodness. Going back to the blue books I heard at They're going theory. back yes, to right. handwritten uh, yeah. answers, which is causing shocks <laughs> across <laughs> the student world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, applaud, I applaud you, I applaud you. But that basic rule is what we all grew up with. Yeah. It's a, you know, that, that, and we've gone, to that. I'm just saying we've just gotten so off the rails, and I do think we need to put resources to, to do this sort of thing. I don't, I don't care where it resides, frankly, but there has to be some system of, of opinions and beliefs. Those are wonderful. Yeah. Everyone can have different That's opinions, fine. but not, not different not facts. Statements of facts. It sounds like we're all in agreement <laughs> that this, it's a problem and we all have some, we have skin in the game and we have a responsibility right. to chip away at it because no one thing's going to solve it. Right. Yeah. No, there's no silver bullet, and it's not going to get any better. <laughs> it's not going to save us. Um, but I think critical thinking, and, oh, yeah. and, and I love that advice that you gave, Dave, about before you share something to check research it. it and check it. I think if everybody did that. It's the same thing I heard in a newsroom years and years ago from some salty old city editor who said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't check that one out. <laughs> um, shall we, have, have shall we wrap? Box Richardson yes. these days? Oh, yeah. I was going to say, we, I felt like that was a good, that was a good note to end on. But, um, and she's, yeah. So can I just echo for Mish Kabay to check multiple sources and also especially <coughs> independent verifiable, fact-based, because if anybody remembers Judith Miller at the Times, yeah. and weapons of mass destruction, and the aluminum tubes, the story I brought up about their story is not a new thing for the New York Times. And as much as we want to rely on the New York Times and the Washington Post, even the UK Guardian, but I'd say they're about 10 points better, there are a huge number of reliable, independent sources. All the people that got fired from mainstream corporate media because they wanted to talk about war and peace or they wanted to talk about corporate incursion into corrupt government or whatever, they now are publishing on Substack, they're doing video on Rumble, and there are other sources, and they are very credible fact-based investigative journalists who want to tell us what our government and what foundation media and corporate-based media doesn't want us to know. So thank you for letting me say that. Go Dave. Yeah. Well, thank you, both of you, very, very much. This was super fascinating. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for having us. And thank you, everyone, for your passion and, and care and concern about such an important issue. Can we thank Scott? Yeah. 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 Yeah.